I'm not saying you should toss out the market theories. I'm not saying you should stop looking at economics or the economy. Quite the contrary. They are one set of ideas as part of the whole, but not the only ones. How do you measure success? Maybe it's money. Maybe your job title. Maybe your family, which sounds healthier, though it depends on your family. Whatever it is, there's usually something tangible to gauge. What happens when the metrics stop working for you? Can you manage what you don't even measure? Hello and welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today I'll explain why some of the basic measurements of our society may no longer be working. And who better to help me sort this out than Jillian Tett of the Financial Times? They measure many things in pink. And who says the scales by which we evaluate everything from the global economy to what constitutes a monopoly is in grave need of a makeover? And then, of course, I've got your puppet regime. We're so excited here at Facebook to introduce a new interactive experience that you're all going to love. But first, a word from the folks who help us keep the lights on. The year was 1890. Corporate behemoths gobbling up the competition, stifling new business, and boosting prices because they could. Standard Oil, for instance, controlled up to 95% of all U.S. oil refining. Public outcry was growing, and so an elder senator from Ohio did something no American lawmaker had ever done before. He authored the first federal law that targeted these guys wanting to root out anti-competitive behavior. It didn't immediately change the game. In fact, U.S. Steel, an American tobacco company, hit their stride after that law, but it eventually served as part of America's bedrock for antitrust. And many of these giants, including Standard Oil, were later broken up. Of course, corporate dreams of unbridled growth, mega mergers, and a reign supreme didn't go away. Just look at the companies behind your mobile phone. The two biggest wireless carriers now control nearly three quarters of all subscribers. In the world of tech, Facebook has been on a buying spree, tallying up 67 unchallenged acquisitions, some of which were potential competitors. Amazon took at least 91. But it's Google who has the brass ring with more than 200. Meanwhile, the rate of new U.S. businesses has nearly been halved since the late 1970s. So it's not exactly the golden era of competitive capital markets. Less competition usually makes inferior products and drives up the cost to you, the consumer. But at least that's still something we're accustomed to measuring, money. If you're paying through the nose buying a new car because GM and Ford just merged and upped their prices, you can feel that. It's cash and regulators are trained to look for price increases after mergers. But what happens when the currency isn't something that comes from your wallet? What if instead of money, it's data, which is being sucked up at a rate which you aren't actually aware of and only will later be monetized? In other words, say Facebook were to acquire Instagram. Yeah, that already happened. Is it possible we all end up paying more in data? How would you know if you're paying too much? Does Facebook have any natural competitors? What's stopping it from sucking up even more data? How would you feel about handing over your health records, your credit score, or the facial recognition patterns of your children, your dog, during these hundreds of daily transactions? It's not like you really have a choice to opt out. Facebook, Google, and Amazon are dominant and together make up 80% of the U.S. online advertising market. Besides, is it really realistic for someone not to Google? If there was another comparable choice out there, maybe you'd choose that instead. But when was the last time you heard someone say, yeah, I'll bing that? Don't, don't do that. It's not cool. Bottom line, there is a cost. It's just not one we're accustomed to measuring, certainly not when it comes to monopolies. But whether these companies are actually anti-competitive or just dominant players, 
is what lawmakers on both Capitol Hill and across the pond in Brussels are trying hard to sort out. Fortunately for you, we've got a rare look at two U.S. senators who are considering this very issue. We now go live to Elizabeth Warren's questioning of Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg. Mr. Zuckerberg, we have grave concerns that your company has recently broken antitrust laws. That's ridiculous. Facebook has been antitrust ever since our first user agreement. Well, just know that I will not be going easy on you today. And neither will I. Who are you? Well, I'm Whitey McOlderson, senator from somewhere in the Louisiana Purchase, and I am ready to take on the Faces book. Oh, God. <laughs> Wait now, don't get your bloomers in a bunch. I know all about this stuff. Why, I handled the famous antitrust case against the wheel industry. Like car tires? No, wheels made of stone. We broke them up, but it was a mistake. It turns out that half a wheel doesn't roll nearly as good. Oh, my. Look, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, would you agree that Facebook and other tech companies are perhaps too powerful? That's totally not true. Americans are welcome to use the alternatives, like writing letters to each other or sitting around and telling stories in the dark. Reasonable argument. The dark was nice. You're free to go, young man. Senator McAlderson, this is important. He needs to answer serious questions. Look, how about this? You guys agree to leave us alone, and we'll break ourselves up. Facebook will become two companies, two communities. One will handle newsfeed, messenger, Instagram, stories, and dating, and the other will handle poking. Cool? Sounds good to me. That's not good at all. Look, these tech companies are violating our privacy, crushing competition, and breaking laws, while America does nothing. At least Europe is trying to regulate them. Hey, don't you let Europe tell you how to regulate an American industry. We don't tell them how to regulate German watches or French cheating on your wife. That's a very good point. Well, hashtag thank you. W wait a minute, Senator McGolderson. You mean... It's not that you are hopelessly out of touch. It's that you don't want to bust up a profitable American industry. <laughs> oh, you silly, naive young woman. Don't you get it? It's both. Because I've been saying now for the best part of a year. So your point is completely on. But I don't think it's a TPP problem. I think it's a 5G problem. I think markets are just so dazed and confused by geopolitical risks, they can't make sense of it. And I have Gillian Tett, who is the head of the editorial board here at the United States, the Financial Times. Good to see you again. Great to be on your show. You know, we always say that we value what we measure, right? Are we measuring the right things? If you could wave a wand and have us pay attention to different numbers or numbers that we don't have right now but we should have, what would they be? I think the fundamental problem today is economists do a great job of measuring things that have a monetary value. So they look at widgets, how many widgets does the factory produce and what do they sell it for? They look at how much you spend in terms of consumption. They look at prices. They look at all these elements measured with money. And one of the problems today is that a significant chunk of our tech economy, the innovation economy, is not based on monetary exchanges, but essentially barter. And by that I mean that consumers are getting a whole avalanche of free services, supposedly free services from tech companies, which are incredibly important for their consumption patterns, for their productivity and how they live their lives, for their economic activity. Mm -hmm. They're not paying money for that. They're essentially paying by giving up data. And there's a swap of data for services which is not actually being mediated by money at all. So that goes entirely uncounted in the statistics that the economists collect. How should it be counted? Well, I think you need to recognize that there's a transaction going on which cannot be measured with numbers alone, and start to realize that barter is actually a very powerful lens to look at the economy today. And there needs to be a lot of discussion about what we're missing as a result of ignoring barter trade. Now, and that, we were... that impacts into how you measure how you look at issues like antitrust, monopoly power of tech companies, et cetera, et cetera. Leaving the regulatory side um, for a moment, if you were to include 
all of that barter in the way you think about a country's economic robustness, its GDP, um, would that then make you feel differently about productivity? Would it make you say, wait a second, there's a lot more going on in this economy than we thought there was? I think that it would certainly make the productivity numbers look more convincing if you could find a way to measure that. Um, I think it also raised questions about this issue of what's happening to prices, consumer prices, because this barter, in a sense, is a way of providing services on an expanding scale without actually directly impacting consumer prices. And yet it may be one factor of actually helping to suppress consumer prices more broadly. Now, the other side, which you just mentioned, was the regulatory aspect. If you don't actually consider that this is a part of monopoly power because it's not considered a part of um, the value that the company is driving, what does that make you think about how they should be regulated? Well, the issue more at stake, at stake is more that um, for the last few decades, regulators in Washington have determined whether a monopoly exists or not on the basis of what it's doing to consumer prices. So if consumer prices are essentially being artificially pushed up, they assume there's a monopoly that's essentially screwing consumers. But if consumer prices are zero? If consumer prices aren't actually there, available, mm -hmm. then you start, need to start rethinking your concept of monopolies. The good news is that that debate is now starting to be had. But frankly, it's quite late in the day. Who's having that debate right now? Well, inside the FTC, there is now discussion around that. And it's also starting to seep into the political um, landscape as well. So on the Hill, you do finally have um, politicians saying, let's start looking at these big companies and see whether they are indeed screwing consumers. And in my mind, the issue at stake is this, that you know, once you recognize that there is a massive barter trade going on, and that actually it's not the case that consumers are being entirely taken advantage of by tech companies taking their data. They're getting something back. They are. Mm. Once you shift it away from the indignant, angry argument of they're just taking our data, that's terrible, to actually there's a barter trade going on, then you ask, well, can we reset the terms of the barter trade in a way that looks fairer to everybody? Should it be much more transparent about what's being given and what's being received? Should there be more options in the market for who you want to barter with? It begins to put it on a more, in some ways, emotionally neutral platform and perhaps more effective one as well. So how do you compete with free? Well, if everyone is essentially dealing with free, and free is barter right now, mm -hmm. then actually it becomes about the terms of trade. How do you structure that trade? So I mean, it's so interesting. We, when we talk on this show, for example, about climate, mm -hmm. you have an entire conversation that the market mechanisms are not able to function the way they should because there's no price. And in here, I hear you saying the same thing with a completely different perspective. We're talking about the way that consumers are getting some of the most important services they presently receive. How far out of whack is the capitalist model because it doesn't have the ability to respond to fundamental changes in the marketplace? Well, here's, here's another way of looking at this, which is this, and that, you know, I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist, and mm -hmm. anthropologists tend to look at everything holistically and spend as much time thinking about what people aren't talking about as what they are talking about. And there's a school of anthropology called economic anthropology, which always looks at the market as simply one facet of the systems of exchanges that bind a society together. So instead of talking about just the economy or the monetary transactions, you look at the world in terms of exchanges in the wider sense. And that includes um, credit, money, and barter all together. And you know, if you take that view, then you accept that actually the market has a role to play, but it's not the only role to play in terms of creating exchanges that bind society together. The problem is that many economists are trained to assume that the market is pretty much the only mechanism or the only really important platform for those exchanges, and that monetary transactions are the only transactions that matter. So in some ways, I'm not saying you should toss out the market theories. I'm not saying you should stop looking at economics or the economy. Quite the contrary. But it's a bit like saying, you know, to somebody in the Catholic Church in the medieval era, don't just assume that um, those that priestly class who seem so powerful and important because they happen to speak Latin and they know the Catholic Church better than everyone else and run it, automatically run everything. They are one set of ideas as part of the whole, but not the only ones. Okay, I so didn't know I you think were going time. to medieval Catholicism, but <laughs> we're fine with that. Um, another thing where we measure a piece, and I've wanted to ask you about this, is the deficit. We talk a lot about the deficit in the United States. I've, I've always wondered, and when you talk about corporations, you look at their balance sheet, mm -hmm. you look at the assets as well as the liabilities. And yet when we talk about the United States and we talk about sovereigns, countries, you talk about their debt 
and that's it, right? Does that affect the way you think about the debate when we talk about a massive deficit spending in the United States? Well, there's two levels of that question, which is firstly, there's a question of whether you're looking at net debt or gross debt. And obviously, the net debt is actually, um, um, you take the gross number and you basically square it off against the immediate source of revenue and assets the government holds. The second question, though, is whether you look at the wider range of assets the government holds, which are not being properly counted or measured. Um, and there are a lot of those. I mean, there are you know, some people advocating for looking at, say, all of the property in real estate that the American government owns and saying, couldn't you manage that much more effectively and actually realize value that way? Doug Detter, a Swedish economist, has advanced those ideas a lot. Um, the problem is that when you start going down that route and saying, well, actually, there's a lot of value you can unlock through a government's assets that make the debt look less scary, you then start to say, well, actually, there's also a lot of unrealized liabilities that are not measured on that deficit figure either to do with pensions, healthcare, Medicare, Medicaid, all of those liabilities for the future. So it's a slightly nebulous picture. So it is very important, yes, to look at the unmeasured assets and the unmeasured liabilities. Um, but it's also important to recognize that you can start arguing about that for a long time. At the end of the day, the markets tend to look much more at the net debt figure not the gro rather than the gross debt figure, but not the widest one of all. Now, the ultimate belief in such a system, and something you write about a lot, is the strength of the dollar. Um, you've been someone who's been pretty consistently mm -hmm. bullish in the belief that the role of the dollar as the global reserve currency is not something that's under particular threat right now. Um, Given your concerns about the growing lack of social cohesion in the US, at what point does that start to change, if at all, in your view? There's a push and a pull factor with the dollar right now. Um, on the one hand, there is no alternative to the dollar on the global stage. And it's quite hard to see when that's going to emerge, at least if you look at it in terms of other nation states or regions. Because although there was tremendous excitement about the euro when that was first launched, the Eurozone remains beset by problems in the fractious political economy. And the Chinese right now show absolutely no ability um, or readiness to really liberalize their ca mm -hmm. capital account and current account in a way that would make their dollar, sorry, the Chinese um, currency a proper rival reserve currency. So almost by default or almost by virtue of an ugly contest, not a beauty contest, the dollar is currently in a prime position. The other side of the equation, though, is the American economy has been growing a lot stronger. And thus far, at least, no matter what you think about the travails of the political world in Washington, the Federal Reserve, the central bank, still commands a considerable amount of respect. Um, and they have performed creditably in recent years. So unless that changes, I think there's going to be quite a lot of support on the dollar for the moment. But the real question is that, you know, in this world of ugly contests, not beauty contests, is it possible that actually the real threat will come from some form of alternative, like a digital currency or cryptocurrency or something outside central banks? And that it may be a more interesting question looking at the medium term. Now, we have seen the Chinese start to dump a small amount of US treasuries over the past few months, coming at the same time that the US-China trade deal appears less likely to get done. Is that in any way an early warning that some of the credibility that you talk about with the Fed, even in the absence of alternatives, could be eroding? Or is it noise and the Chinese can't do anything no matter what? I don't think the Chinese will be dumping um, those treasuries right now as a sign of loss of, credit, loss of belief in the Fed. It's probably a small political signal. And it's probably also tied to the management of reserves as well. Um, but it certainly indicates that there is this tremendous imbalance right now, which is that the Chinese have not just been exporting a lot to the US, but they've also been essentially gobbling up treasuries left, right, and center. And they're not the only ones. Um, so that's definitely a risk. Now, what's very interesting, though, is if you look at the data on who owns treasuries, you've seen quite a significant shift in the last four or five years, where you had this great growth in foreign holdings of treasuries, the Chinese and Japanese, um, a decade ago. But since then, you've had a tremendous growth in domestic holdings of treasuries. And it seems that at the moment, partly because of a lack of alternatives of things to buy, partly because of a general safety concern, partly because of regulatory pressure on banks, the domestic demand for treasuries is certainly strong enough to keep um, yields very low. So two and a half 
plus years of a Trump administration saying we're going to squeeze, we're going to hit other countries, a lot of people saying we don't like that, you know, massive social dislocation sensibility in the U.S., all these divides. But the reality economically is that not only is the strength of the dollar what it was, but the robustness of the American balance sheet, from your perspective, no market impact. Yeah, I mean, you have to realize that one of the things about America that makes it a bit of an outlier on the world stage is it's very low dependency on trade and exports as part of its overall GDP. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's much lower than almost any other major economy. So to a certain extent, America can weather a trade war better than many of its rivals. Doesn't mean that it won't be very painful, but um, you know, the American economy has continued to grow. But that's also because there has been a bit of a sugar high but with does that, cheap money. Does that imply that the use of tariffs specifically tariffs, as a weapon to get other countries to do what the Americans want is actually one of the most effective asymmetric economic weapons the Americans have? It's certainly one of the more effective weapons than they've, they have than the other weapons that have been tried in recent years. They're going through the WTO. Um, the irony, of course, is that it hurts American companies quite often, but that's not necessarily the same as the overarching economy in terms of relative pain compared to other countries. Um, for what it's worth, I'm in a camp that thinks that tariffs is a rather clumsy, crude tool. Um, you know, I'm very much in the free trade camp, but, you know. You do work for the Financial Times, yep. yes. Yeah, well, I happen to think that globalization is a good thing, but there we go. No, but, but, but the imposition of tariffs um, aren't necessarily because you want tariffs to go up. They're also potentially because you want to beat the other country down. And I guess I'm just asking that if you believe that the Americans are much less vulnerable to mm -hmm. tariff hikes in a trade war, and if you want to get other countries to a better place, better place from your perspective, is that effective? So, you know, again, well, it, the it, issue yeah. right now is that the president is using tariffs in a pretty unpredictable way. Mm -hmm. That is, from his point of view, very effective because it's keeping all his, you know, his enemies imbalanced mm -hmm. and uncertain. Um, the problem is, of course, it's keeping business imbalanced and uncertain as well. And that's where you could begin to feel some of the um, backlash and pressure from corporate America. But thus far, that backlash and pressure hasn't been strong enough to seriously change course. I want to move to someplace completely different now, something you've been looking at recently, which is the issue that political parties in democratic countries are increasingly ineffective and maybe even going away. What do you mean by that? Well. If you look at what's happened in the UK recently with the European elections, what you've seen is a collapse of the traditional Conservative and Labour Party quite dramatically. <clears throat> that doesn't just reflect the Brexit issue, although it's been fueled by it and fanned by it. Um, it reflects a pattern you see right across Europe right now, um, which is that traditional parties are suffering. And you can say, well, that's just a case of anti-establishment feelings. You can say that's a case of the right rising or the left rising. Or you can stop and say, well, actually, almost every other area of our life has been disrupted by technology in the last couple of decades. Maybe politics has essentially been disrupted too. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is that political parties today are like the political equivalent of albums um, in the market. They are preset packages decided by people in the 20th century. And millennials care about issues, they care about ideas, they care about celebrity brands. It's all pick and mix politics. They the don't Brexit want to be... party, for example. Brexit party. A you got... single issue exactly. party around one, can we call him a political celebrity? Well, you have Brexits, you have Greens. Yes. You have celebrity politicians, mm -hmm. you have comedians in Italy. The five-star movement, yes. The only politician who's actually carved out, new politician, carved out a centrist, technocratic platform. It's Emmanuel Macron. Is Macron, mm -hmm. who basically created his own party, his own pick and mix party. Exactly. So it hasn't done very well with it. Well, but that's how he won election on a pick and mix party. Yes. Donald Trump essentially is, has pick and mix politics. You know, is he a Republican or Democrat? Who the hell knows? So what does this say to you about the Democrats in 2020 and what's likely to work? Well, if they want to appeal to voters and get momentum, they need to have basically a pick and mix celebrity, a pick and mix idea. AOC is too young. She is too young, but she actually, the only person who challenges Donald Trump in terms of social media usage and actually understands as well. Jillian Ted, thank you very much. Thank you. And now for something completely different, I've got your puppet regime. 
We're so excited here at Facebook to introduce a new interactive experience that you're all going to love. It's called Face to Face. You get to connect directly with your audience and tell them how you feel. Here's how it works. Hi, Rick. My name is Mark. Give me all of your data. That's our show this week. We'll be back next week. Don't miss it. Please don't miss it. You know how important it is for me that you keep coming back every week. It's why we do the show. And if you've liked what you've seen, do check us out on gzeromedia.com.